high. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, before we start this conversation, let me give you a very brief introduction to the plastic turn. The plastic turn offers a novel way of looking at plastic as the defining material of our age and at plasticity of plastic as an innovative means of understanding the arts and literature. Ranjun Ghosh terms this approach the material aesthetic and through this concept traces the emergence and development of plastic polymers along the same historical trajectory as literary modernism. Plastics growth as a product in the culture industry its formation through multiple application and chemical synthesis and its circulation via oceanic movements, Ghosh argues, corresponds with and offers novel insights into developments in modernist literature and critical theory. Through innovative readings of canonical modernist texts, analysis of artworks, and accounts of plastic's devastating environmental impact, the plastic turn proposes plastic's unique properties and destructive ubiquity as a theory machine to explain literature and life in the Anthropocene. Introducing several new concepts like plastic literature, plastic literary, etc into critical humanist discourse. Ghosh enmeshes uh, literature and theory, materiality and philosophy, history and ecology to explore why plastic as a substance and as an idea intrigues, disturbs and haunts us. So uh, this was a very brief, brief introduction to the Plastic Term, which was published by Cornell University Press in the year uh, 2022. Uh, very soon, we are uh, going to organize uh, a gala event on the Plastic Term, uh, a big conference. Um, but this, this small conversation, this brief conversation would be like, an, like a prelude to that gala event. So, yeah, so uh, I uh, will start with James then. Hi. You uh, can take it up from here. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, JJ. Uh, thank you. And thank you to the organizers and especially to Ranjan for engaging with me in this conversation. I'm very happy to see everybody here. Uh, and this is a great opportunity to discuss uh, Ranjan's special uh, and very important work, and also for me to uh, explore some of my own interests. So I'm very grateful. Uh, so good evening to most of you. Uh, good morning to a few of you like myself. Um, so I'm going to start just uh, uh, right ahead. Before we do you. that, uh, before we do that, um, can we just uh, discuss the format, how we are going okay. to go about it? So. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's a conversation. Uh, so you can uh, uh, you can reflect upon the plastic turn, give your observations, and Professor Koch will uh, interject. He will uh, he will also respond to your queries and uh, your observations and all. And then we can move over to uh, the, uh, the discussion session uh, where we will open this session for Q and A. So I think this is okay, I, I, can, I guess. Uh, and before we do that, let me just introduce uh, James Martel and Ron Mungor briefly because these people do not need any introduction, but uh, it's a thing, so I have to do it. Uh, James Martel, uh, as we all know, is a professor, associate professor of Romance Language at Lyon College. He co-edited Samuel Beckett and the Encounter of Philosophy and Literature, Roman Books with Orko Chattopadhyay in 2013 and with Fernanda Negrete in 2018, a special volume of Samuel Beckett today, titled Beckett Beyond Words, 
and in 2021, uh, tattooed bodies, theorizing body inscription across disciplines and cultures, Paul Gray, with Eric Larson. His book, Modernism, Self-Creation, and the Maternal, the Mother's Son, Rutledge, was published in uh, 2019. He is currently editing a book on Marcus de Sade and modernism, as well as working on a monograph on surfaces of thought in European literature and philosophy. Um, Ronjan Ghosh teaches in the Department of English, University of North Bengal, a, trans uh, a trans-infusionist whose work covers a wide area of subjects like critical theory, comparative philosophy, philosophy of history and uh, education, cultural theory, and currently plastic studies. Ghosh is widely published in journals like Diacritics, Substance, MLN, University of Toronto Quarterly, Comparative Education Review, History and Theory, College Literature, and others. Among his many books, including, uh, <clears throat> includes uh, Thinking Literature Across Continents, published by Duke University Press with J. Hillis Miller, Philosophy and Poetry, Continental uh, Philosophies, published by Columbia University Press, Plastic Tego, which is forthcoming with, and will be published by Oxford University Press, and the trilogy that he is completing to establish the discipline of plastic humanities. Uh, plastic Turn uh, has been published by Cornell University Press. Plastic Figures is coming out again from Cornell University Press next year, 2024, and uh, Plastic Literature, uh, which is again uh, is coming in 2025, I guess. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, so I have already introduced Ronjan uh, Ghosh and James Martin. James, I think uh, the floor is yours. You can just take it up from here. Thank you, Jaijit. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, okay, yeah, we're gonna start this conversation. Uh, I have some questions that I want to discuss with Ranjan and then for all of you to join us at the with the discussion part at the end. Um, so, uh, Ranjan, in your work, or just across your whole work in the last couple of years, uh, as Jajit already mentioned, you have been developing uh, what is a very rich and varied uh, series of notions around plasticity, the plastic, and other related terms, right? Uh, in this book, in the plastic term, you have a particular definition that I, uh, I really like, and I want to quote it for everybody to follow. If you all have the book, uh, it's page five uh, on the book at the beginning. So. This definition goes, plastic in this book is a discourse at once conceptual and material, and it is an aesthetic figure that emerges from the material. As a material and material problematic, plastic has its own structure of representations and meanings. However, as a discourse, it builds an oppositional network of concepts and signifiers, end of quote. So this, this quote, this definition, highlights a double dimension of plasticity for you, seems to me, right? The discursive and then the figural or material. Do you consider this bidimensionality essential to all plasticity and, and or to what is plastic, right, in, in all of your work? Or is this just a particular key to this book? Um. Uh, thank you, Georgit. Thank you, Georgit, for introducing me. And uh, thank you, the coordinators, the organizers, for making this event possible. I am not a very event person. I do not talk much across forums. But this uh, particular event uh, was a little exciting for me in a, for, for the first time because I could get to talk about the book and talk about the research that I have been making, or rather, introducing into uh, uh, plastic studies, trying to develop a kind of a different direction here. And also that James, my uh, a lovely scholar, a deep scholar who, who wanted to have a conversation with me and I was very eager to have a conversation. At the same time, I thought it would be wonderful to really have a conversation with James around this book because very importantly, uh, James had reviewed this book in the year's work on critical and cultural theory, the journal, and uh, James seen into 
plastic studies in a sense that especially the philosophy of plastic therapies was very interested in. I remember having read James's work on Derrida and plasticity. So um, I thought this would be a very good opportunity to connect, to converge, and probably uh, develop a conversation which many of you might just like to join and talk and maybe parley upon. So um, one thing that I would like to say here before actually going to uh, uh, talk about, uh, or rather responding to what James said, is that um, I know this book is a difficult book, and uh, I know that there are lots of other discourses, many different kinds of discourses that have got into this book. So, you know, if I really start to talk in a very technical language, and especially in a very theoretical language, then it just might not be as interesting as I want this conversation to be. So I would like to keep this very simple for all of you. Most of you here uh, who would be probably introduced to this this is a different brand of plastic theory, different version of plastic theory that this book tries to foreground. So um, I would just try to keep it simple and easy for most of you so that when the discussion begins, you can intervene with your questions and uh, intervene with your queries and curiosities. That might be a very good forum for both of us to really develop our responses. So yes, um, I agree with James uh, that uh, this is the the material and the aesthetic. Uh, this has been my concern because um, having invested myself into new material studies and especially new material studies, I'm in both because there is a distinction here. I don't want to get into that, but I'm just mentioning here the new material studies and the new material studies. When one gets into that, then one actually starts to feel that Probably one way or the other, if one goes into saying that um, um, there is a risk, you know, that uh, if you are going through so sheer materialism, or especially a kind of, um, you know, I would say, a unilateral materialist theory, then one runs the risk of actually being cornered into interrelated problems, say, of causal mechanisms or determinism and reductionism. So what happens is that the form and matter, you know, they traditionally, they are understood as decisively influential, say, in a Cartesian or a Newtonian inflections. They become very dumb. They become inert and passive. The form and matter, that's what I'm saying. When you are trying to understand this decisively through a Cartesian or a Newtonian uh, inflections, then it becomes very dumb and inert. Because, you know, what it tries to do is that um, matter it's been, it's been looked at this like matter is moved but it never moves so matter becomes predetermined but never determining so it's always requiring something else beyond it that is the transcendent to it to activate matter to shape matter to form matter so uh, what happens is that matter has a fate but it does not have a future so what happens is that as has been argued that um this form in its own state becomes a little constricted. It, 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 it actually squelches the singular. So you do not have anything that starts to move the matter on its own. So this is, this is something that uh, starts to happen. But what actually Malabu does, or in a way what Malabu in a very structural way also aligns with Alai Badu in trying to develop this idea of the matter, is that um, plasticity, it, it, it refuses to be a kind of ossification. When I say ossification, I mean that is something that is fixed, inflexible. So plasticity, the way Malabu introduces it, not really in terms of the matter, because um, Malabu is more interested in the philosophical lineage of the word plasticity. Because it goes back to the Greeks, it, he, he, he goes back to understanding the medieval period. And obviously there is um, the, the big reference to Hegel, probably we will come to that later, when Hegel talks about his lectures on fine arts and it differentiates between the different kinds of art forms and considers sculpture to be, um, to be uh, the, the most ingenious of all plastic forms. So that we will come later, but Malabo works through that tradition. So I do not want to repeat that because 
she has done extraordinary work in trying to bring this entire lineage into great prominence and great circulation, primarily trying to invent uh, Hegel from a very different perspective as much as Heidegger and Kant. But um, this, this sort of an understanding of the plasticity, you know, it what it does, it, it, it changes the very idea of this form and matter. So this matter and form, the dialectic, the matter and form, the bidimensionality that, uh, that James was mentioning, it starts to change. So when it starts to change, there is a sort of a, a neo-Hegelian materialist camp starts to get built. And what happens is that form starts to lose this sort of, uh, what should I say, a kind of a, 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 a stoic privilege of its own. That is, the, the, the resiliency of the form starts to be built in a different way. How it does, I will just give you the distinction that Malabo brings. A little bit of a Malabo before I come to tell you what I have done. Malabo differentiates between the elasticity and plasticity. When, he, when, when she differentiates that, what, she's, what she tries to point out is that elasticity is something that you change only to get back to form. So when you are deforming something or actually in a way uh, uh, pushing a form to lose its original form, then there is a chance of that coming back to its original form, the resilience, the turning back, the, the, the kind of a recursivity, if you might like to use that term. But the plasticity would be where if you do change a form, then that form can actually mean that the entire form that you're trying to change might get annihilated. It just might get destroyed and it just produces something different. So there can be an explosion of form. That is with that explosion of form, obviously, as you can imagine, the content might change as well. So. Malibu actually mentions that to be the destructive plasticity, or you can call it the negative plasticity, where the things start to really change completely. That is, if you there is no way that that A when it changes to B, the B can get back to the A, like the one that happens in elasticity. So people have a sort of a misconception about, or rather, this misconception is something about interchanging the two terms, elastic and the plastic, which, which Manabo, in a very nuanced way, creates a kind of a difference, which is, which is very helpful in understanding how this plasticity works. So if such a kind of a plasticity is there, where you have the destructive plasticity, a plasticity as a kind of a, an explosive plasticity, if you, if you might use that term, then you do get the notion of the accident. It is uh, something that happens where plastic could be seen as an accident. Like uh, she traces the genealogy of plastic to the French origin of the word bomb. That is, there is an explosion, a bomb. So it's when it, it, it explodes. So what happens is the accident factor, or rather the dimension of the accident, it gets factored in. And uh, uh, the project becomes any kind of thing that one wants to do. It is just not a happening, but it's also an happenstance. So there is the way the incident and the accident come together in understanding how an event or a thought or a discourse can proceed. This is one way of looking at plasticity. So when I devoted my years into reading Heidegger, Hegel, Kant, Malabo, Derrida, I just try to figure out what exactly I'm actually going to do if I'm going to write a book on plastic. Because I, uh, I for one, would, if people know me well, or people who read me, they know me well, that I, for one, would never write a book like an introduction to plasticity. I, for one, would never write a book like uh, a glossary of terms related to uh, philosophy of plasticity. I would probably never write a book on plasticity and environment or plastic pollution. These are things that I am not good at and something that I'm not inspired by. There is no, there is no uh, a rejuvenation for me to go back and do these kind of things, this kind of books. There are, I know of many people who are very good at that and have huge respect for them, the way they do such things, but I cannot. So I started thinking about how I actually can build up a book on plastic where Malibu 
who happens to be my very good friend. Uh, she's been very nice, very generous. Uh, well, I found that Malibu is right on my shoulder, breathing heavy, because she, um, whatever I want to think about Hegel or whatever I want to think about any of those people, like William James or John Dewey or Santiana, who people, the people who have actually introduced the word plastic, there are many modernist writers as well, like uh, Mondrian for that matter. So, I mean, there are people who have used the word plastic, but every time I went down to do it, I actually found that I have to hold the finger of Malabo to do this, metaphorically. So I decided what I can do now. So I went back to the material. That's the way I'm actually, through this introduction, I'm trying to answer James' question finally. It's that when I went back to see what I can do with plastic, I went back to the matter. I went back to the material. I didn't I, I didn't go to the form. I didn't go to the content. I went to the matter. So when I went back to the matter, I realized that I actually don't know about plastic. Most people who write in plastic, they do not have any kind of a scientific foundation of what that material is. This was this is something I discovered. People talk about plasticity, people talk about plastic pollution because plastic is so ubiquitous, plastic is so immanent, plastic it has this sort of a distributive ease around us. So we, we, we know that this is plastic, but we exactly don't know what this matter is composed, constituted and how it's formed. So I went back to the formation of the matter, which took me around at least um, three years that I spent reading polymer sciences and organic chemistry going back to my earlier days and I just tried to bring in all I redoing everything and then I realized what a fantastic material what an exciting material plastic is that is when plastic actually gets into the laboratory and plastic becomes a completely different material which not only has the external activation in place but also has this ability to internally inherently actuate itself so plastic became a sort of a activation, not only externally induced, but internally agentialized. So the material, material started to talk to me in a very different way. Scores of scientific research papers that I went through, the diagrams, the, 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 different, the different kinds of graphs that I had to read, different kinds of terms that I started to learn and introduce into my writing, like the rheology like the temperature coefficient like threshold temperature i mean these are these are different terms that came into my my vocabulary so for the first time i realized that there is a vocabulary that is there to be learned outside postmodernism. so critical theory critical theory for me started to change there so that was the first thing that i went to the material but then i told myself again that if i really know this uh, a scientific discourse so well and I know all the material that how the material functions and behaves and how things really work in the laboratory what am I going to do writing a book on this because um, I cannot match the scientists who have spent 50 years researching on plastic again my book would be uh, squelched at the very beginning so I started to see that does plastic the behavior of the plastic really can correspond to what I'm good at, that is humanities. Does, the, does, there any, does there any kind of a link, a correspondence between the two? Now, that was a very tough job because one, when one starts to work on the intertices between sciences and humanities, remember, that's a great thing to do. That's a great, great approach to have because we cannot really form such segregated departments between sciences and humanities, which is probably been getting at this moment very very bad in terms of funding in terms of people not talking to the departments and not people communicating with the departments but when you are opening up windows between departments or among departments you have to be very sure which window you should open and which one you should remain closed because if you start to open all the windows then what you do is that you're diluting the borders between sciences and humanities and the end you find yourself really in a self-agonizing pit because you will not be able to come out of that. 
So your understanding has to be very nuanced about exactly how much to what limit you can push sciences to really come to an interface with humanities or negotiate or dialogue with humanities. That is something that took me a long time to do in this book. These things do not show in the book. When people actually read the book, they do not, they read the discourse, but they do not see that kind of, uh, the kind of thinking and the kind of research and the kind of pain that I went through to read scientific papers and alongside read Hegel. So, I mean, these two, these two drafts are very different. When you start to read about polymer externalization and you start to read the, uh, the, the Hegel and the idea of habit, I mean, you're reading these two things that are completely different. But there comes the connection that you start to build about the material that I have just been focusing on. And here is the aesthetic where I start to read the poem. I start to read the play. I start to talk about art. I start to talk about thinking and how I see plastic actually starts to influence. The bidimensionality does not stay bidimensional, James, because there is nothing binary in a sense, because the bidimensionality apparently changes to multidimensionality because when sciences starts to talk i mean material sciences starts to talk to the aesthetic by aesthetic i mean the literary i mean the literary arts uh, we will talk about plastic arts very soon as in course of the conversation but when it starts to communicate then there's no bidimensionality between the material signifier and the aesthetic signifier the material signified communicating with the aesthetic signifier that is exactly not the way i was trying to look at it i was trying to see how science starts to explode push its borders get a little porous so that there is more dimension that comes out from the sciences other than just reading plastic behavior and noting at seriatim the different features of plastic but at the same time trying to see how those features of plastic in a way starts communicating with the aesthetic of reading that could be art that could be poetry that could be a play that could be a novel that could be anything but that has to be humanities so plasticity was not really the issue here i will uh, uh clear this out for you with my last sentence that plasticity is was not really the issue here it is the plasticity of plastic that was the real issue. So what happens in the book when my readers, they started reading this book and it was, it went down to the anonymous external readers. Most of them, they wrote back saying that where is Malabo? Where is the idea of Hegel? Then my response to it was that did Hegel know about plastic? Hegel knew about plasticity. Hegel did not know about plastic. No Kant, no Heidegger. They did not have, whether you go back to the, uh, uh, say, Richard Potts for that matter, in the in, in Elizabeth and the post Elizabethan period, they did not have any idea about plastic. So plastic material comes to us only in the late 1920s. So, you know, there are two stages that I started to divide in my mind. One was the plasticity before plastic, that was 1920. The second one was plasticity after plastic, that is after 1920. So even if we are 100 years into organizing a big conference like Plastic Turn, it is around 1917, 1920s and 22 that really brought plastic into the domain of our material use, into, the, into our global utilitarian politics. It is how plastic got introduced. So two different plasticities. Now, my book, is not about the former my book is about the latter so every time you read every single page of the book you would see how the material speaks to you and the material is not speaking to you in a bi-dimensional way it's speaking to you in a multi-dimensional way with all its impact effect effect and also its turns and returns that you develop through the material so probably uh if i really have to add my last sentence to the response is that this was a very different way of looking at new materialism new materialism in a in, in, in alongside the way you combine materialism with aesthetics and i just want to add um uh, my dear friend catherine malabo uh, i remember writing to me after she read the whole book and in an email she wrote to me 
on 18th June, I'm quoting that email, uh, 18th June, 2022, uh, Catherine wrote to me uh, saying that, uh, Ranjan, your book is really brilliant. And following parts, I did not explore myself, which is very enriching. So well, that was a real reward for me, that after years of work, I could actually get such a kind of a command from an authority who has built an entire institution in plastic studies to say that I did not, that she did not follow paths that she did not explore and my book could explore finally. So that made me really happy. Excellent, thank you. Uh, thank you for such a rich response and it already kind of uh, advances some of the questions that I have for later. Uh, what I want uh, in your response, something that I found very interesting is that, as you mentioned, the tradition that Malabu is following, um, you know, you mentioned Hegel a lot. And I think what is interesting about the question that I ask you and your response is that, you know, you say there is no bidimensionality at the end, right? Uh, and that's kind of like the original impulse of Hegel's logic. And we'll talk about logic later today, right? The, the original impulse is that precisely the discourse of the logos is itself what is the material substance of the world, right? Like uh, spirit is a bone, the famous quote from Hegel shows that. Um, and it, it connects it also to this idea of plasticity from a, a purely logical Hegelian point of view that you, you are specifying, even though it's again, as you are mentioning, plasticity before plastic. And we'll, we'll talk about that leap later, right? But it connects it to as well to in this kind of like explosion of multiplicity to more of the Deleuzean side of your own uh, theory, where I see more of a, in the polymers and in the forms of plastic material itself, something closer to like a rhizomatic explosion, right? Like something that goes beyond the traditional dualist, uh, highly, highly morphism form matter and so on. Um, so thank you. Uh, I wanna just like uh, piggyback on this to my next question, uh, because it seems that precisely in such a cons consideration of new forms of, new, of materialism, if you will, of new materialism that go beyond this hylomorphism. Uh, something that I notice in your book and in other of your works is a particular rhythm, right? Like you, you mentioned precisely um, how your, your book might be difficult, right? And I think uh, as any good book, like, yeah, there is some kind of difficulty, but I think it has to do always with the, the kind of rhythm that not only uh, if you will, like the, the, the sound of the words or the, the syntax, but also the waves of thought, the way th thought starts like moving, right? So this kind of rhythm that I find in, in the plastic turn in this book uh, reminds me of one of my favorite uh, modernism dictums by Beckett, right? Form is content, content is form, right? Um, so I want to ask you, what are for you the relation between plasticity or plastics themselves and rhythm Right, like understood not only as we know as, as music, right, uh, but also as biological rhythms or even ontological ones, right? The rhythm of the cosmos, if you will, the music of the spheres, of the molecules, cells, right, atoms, and the new kind of like materials that were created. So, yeah, like especially I think going back to the, what you were mentioning in this new materialism and Hegel and so on, like all of these books have a particular rhythm, like Hegel's is very interesting and the idea goes into it, but yours are different. And, and the fact that you are doing a trilogy. That's part of that rhythm, right? So please do talk about rhythm with us, Randy. Um, yes, James, uh, I think uh, rhythm is extremely uh, important uh, for me because this is a concept that uh, that I have been working a lot over the, over the many years now, especially when I started to talk about transinfusion as a, as, as a way of reading humanities. So if, if Transinfusion is a way of uh, rediscovering those uh, unexplored areas of the humanity. It is all about a different kind of rhythm that one puts in. But um, uh, rhythm, if you if you talk about, you know, uh, say for instance, uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a going back to see how rhythm has always been in my consciousness before I come to talk about the term that I have introduced in the book called uh, Plastic Tagore, which is coming up next year. The book is, the, the term is called Plastic Rhythm. Now people have spoken about rhythm, but what is this plastic rhythm that I have spoken about, which uh, I will talk to you a little about it. 
Um, say, for instance, if you go back to um, Aristides, I mean, uh, when Aristides is talking about how rhythm it, it, it applies to, say, the proportionality in static objects, it, the proportionality in static objects, or the proportionality in physical movement and music. So Aristides actually speaks about this, or you can just about even be there all, and uh, if you're looking at um, the roles and the, the later dictionary of the music or the encyclopedia you can see he's again bringing this idea of the rhythm primarily drawn from this uh, idea of the music an idea of how things really flow in waves how there is less interference and more synchronization of understanding in waves so uh, this is also something that uh, uh, rhythm does i'm just talk talking about these things for my audience because so that you can get to see that how how I'm bringing a difference. So I'm actually talking about these things slightly outside the primary focus of James's question, uh, because I thought that's the way if I respond, things might be more interesting to people here. So uh, even Schelling, for that matter, uh, I mean, he, he, he who breaks through this into this world of representation and uh, uh, via the expression in music where which Schelling calls the primal rhythm of nature. That's the way he, he's claimed. And he claims that through rhythm is humans, they impose their, their variety or their diversity onto everything. And also uh, uh, through rhythm, they start to find pleasure and in an entire unity within particular multiplicity. That's what I'm quoting from Schelling. Schelling actually uses this term. It's an entire unity within a particular multiplicity and uh, often it happens that rhythm can also bring a sort of an essentially meaningless succession into a meaningful one that is also something that rhythm can do so there is a way of actually looking at uh, a rhythm where um, Schelling starts to go down, get down to music and then of course it gets different but this is these are the two the three points that I mentioned that are very important in understanding rhythm through Schelling all the three parts in music that Schelling talks about is rhythm melody and modulation but uh, Nietzsche if you look at Nietzsche's uh, the early lectures like um, rhythmic researchers if that's the lecture you look at you will see that uh, Nietzsche actually saw a uh, Greek mathematical rhythms from the fluid. Uh, that's what he, he, he saw in that rhythmic researchers where he starts to see the Greek mathematical rhythms from the fluid, living rhythms of the body, as it anticipates, of course, his influential thesis on the Apollonian and the Nicene distinctions. And uh, this also um, uh, helps me to see that uh, Nietzsche actually finds primality, primality of will, in both rhythm and dance. And he also mentions that without music, without music, life would be an error. So I just love this. So I'm just using this for you. And it is the, the, the Dionysic necessity of the rhythm. It's just not the Apollonian. It's the Dionysic necessity of the rhythm that is so important. And one must really dance to enter fully bodily into the life of the world. Um, and just to just kind of an amusing aside, I really see uh, the other day on Facebook, James dancing. So that's what I also saw. So that's a, that's a humorous aside, James. So one must actually dance to enter fully the bodily into the life of the world. And I remember also uh, Nietzsche talking about that I would only believe in a God. I would only believe in a God who knew how to dance. So this is an extremely important uh, uh, line in understanding the rhythm that way. But yes, um, if you are looking, going back to Hollerin as well and Holdlin talking about all his rhythm and the entire destiny of humankind is one heavenly rhythm. So uh, uh, every single walk of art is one soul rhythm. So uh, Hollerin also is mentioning the rhythm in that way. But yes, uh, the person who would actually have uh, probably have a greater stake here and uh, certainly somebody who you cannot miss out on is uh, uh, Henry, Henry Lefebvre because uh, Lefebvre's rhythm analysis is something that changes the way we look at certain things. 
and not only society culture but also anthropological and political understanding but um one must remember about rhythm just two or three sentences before i come to my idea of the plastic rhythm is that rhythms are not found in pure states they, they cannot be found in pure states so you know they, they do come through ecological relations and uh, those relations they can be territorialized those relations can be understood those relations can be in a way framed and formed in a different way so there is a sort of a complex that starts to get built between territory and rhythm now i'm gradually coming to my point so it's the territory and the rhythm complex that becomes very essential in, in, in actually understanding the rhythm that way so how do you actually develop a kind of a territory through rhythm rhythm is just not about stability it is just not about bringing things together but it's also about getting things together only to reframe the togetherness if i put it this way it's about getting things together in such a way that it reframes the togetherness so the rhythm can also be a sort of a disruption of the rhythm from which you began so even the arrhythmic something that is not a rhythm something that hampers the rhythm can also be a part and a very important factor and a force that contributes to the rhythm itself so um uh, i remember i remember uh, lefber actually mentioning this I, I like this metaphor so i want to share with you all here yeah, this metaphor of of a balcony you know uh, and that is as a place outside the, the the bustling rhythm of a street yet in perfect position to hear participate and analyze its rhythms so the balcony so to achieve that perfect balance you know is to remain both inside and outside uh, again so this is very close to where i'm actually getting to now so to achieve the perfect balance is to is to remain both inside and outside and in order to grasp and analyze rhythms it is necessary to get outside them but not completely a certain exteriority enables the analytic intellect to function the exteriority is important because that analytic intellect has to function it just cannot be affected it just cannot be emotional rhythm just cannot be a question of joy it cannot be just an exaltation so however to grasp a rhythm it's necessary to have been grasped by it as lafaba puts it that to grasp a rhythm it is necessary to have been grasped by it one must let oneself go give oneself over abandon oneself to its duration then it starts to provide the rhythm so what happens is there's this moments of exteriority at the same time holding on to the interiority the moments of transcendence which does not necessarily mean that you have cut all your threads away and have disappeared this is going to give you a separate kind of rhythm where you are grasping something and also staying grasped where you're giving oneself over abandoning oneself over to a kind of a rhythm this abandonment to the rhythm produce almost a kind of a nocian errancy i like call it that errancy is where you can move out of certain things and develop your own excess plastic rhythm for me produces this kind of an excess there is a sort of a submergence in a rhythm only to produce a surplus so when this submergence and surplus comes together then uh, the interesting uh, aspect that I, i i stay very interested in is that when i was talking about um this um in plastic tagore the book where i where i've spoken a lot about plastic rhythm where uh, i start to say that um the plastic moments when you when you when you are bringing this plastic moments these are these are again as i said very complex moments these are these are where rhythm is not for the form shaping this is rhythm is not for form establishment this rhythm is all the time in a malabian way it's about forming that is the forming as a way of form that is how to put it uh, in a very uh, now of course a cliche way is like the formability that is the formability so how you are actually making form able at the same time the form also enables itself to produce differently 
both are different kinds of rhythm that come together. So plastic moments that I'm talking about when it comes to plastic rhythm is uh, not about Bergsaw's instant, well, Andre Bergsaw's instant, where Bergsaw makes a case for uh, a linear, unbroken, progressing time as duration. But this this the involution that I'm talking about, not evolution, the involution that I'm talking about uh, from Lefebvre in terms, it's, it speaks of discontinuities, where understanding is often about the rupture of the mundane. So that's the way I've looked at this person, Tagore. There is always he has looked into rupturing his, his relationship with the mundane. The mundane, when it gets ruptured, it gets transformed. The transformation, the trans exemplification of the mundane can only come not through engagement, not through exploration, but for a rupture. That is the plastic rhythm. So this is not a separation from the everyday. You know, it's a rupture that transcends, as I say, the banality of uh, uh, of the everyday into distinct forms of experiences. So representation, if you look at representation, you would see that representation can really have a separate life of its own when it actually starts to get understood through plastic rhythm. I think uh, this should be enough uh, so that later we can obviously talk about the rhythm. We will talk a lot about rhythm, James, later. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. I, I really especially liked um, that you mentioned Schelling and you went to Schelling and Nietzsche. Uh, because for, for my own uh, studies, at some point, I, uh, especially working on post-structuralism and what goes beyond the structure, uh, I see a kind of like a common underground uh, thread uh, between especially Derrida and Deleuze that goes through rhythm. And Deleuze very much through Schelling and Derrida, and both of them actually from Nietzsche. So I, that's what it was interesting for me to see in your own work that uh, this notion working, and I love the quotes that you were bringing to it, uh, and I'm excited about the Tagore book in that sense. Um, I want to now uh, kind of, again, piggyback, I like ha having a rhythm to our conversation, right? Um, and here, I'm going to start by uh, giving a, a shout out to um, our uh, editor, uh, Jaijit Sarkar, of the upcoming book, Transinfusion, Reflections for Critical Thinking, because uh, my question has to do with uh, what I was a, what I did in that chapter uh, regarding uh, a, a, your work. That book that is coming out soon uh, is uh, based on a couple of reflections of, of many scholars, right? For some of you, if you don't know it, on other book of yours, uh, Transinfusion uh, and Contemporary Thought, right? So when I got that task, I, I was invited to do that. Uh, it coincided with the fact that I was in Venice at the Biennale uh, last year. And I was rereading re your book and looking at the beautiful pavilions and, and all the art and like just kind of working with that fantastic experience of like just, you know, infinite multiplicities of experiences and so on. And the main thing about that Biennale was that it was based on surrealism and especially on female artists. Uh, the title of the Biennale was The Milk of Dreams which is based on uh, Leonora, Car uh, sorry, it's based yeah, on a Leonora Carrington book that she wrote uh, for her children. And, yeah. and later I started noticing in, in other discussions with, uh, as, as, as I just mentioned, like I'm working on SAD, so with uh, scholars like Alice Mahon and so on, there is this resurgence of surrealism uh, coming really, really strong. And especially with the like non-cis male, like kind of like feminist and queer pot potentialities of or surrealism and queer in many ways, right? Um, so then thinking about that, I, I started to think about like the promise of surrealism, but surrealism started, right? Uh, most people, when we talk about the surreal, we the, the meaning has become this idea of something like the bizarre, uh, close, in, close even to the Kafkaesque, right? Like what is just strange. Uh, probably we got this from all the Dalis paintings that we get to see, right? Where we go to the original impulse of it, right? Like uh, coming from the French term, surreal is the over real, right? The, what is the, the extra real, what is more talking about your excess, right? Uh, so I, I thought about like this promise of surrealism of like going beyond the structures and like the understandings that we have precisely into this kind of excess of dancing, if you will, uh, if you will. And then that re made me think precisely of the plastic turn 
and going now playing a little bit with the notion of turn and turning and what does that do in a rhythmic fashion, right? So yeah, do you see in, in our contemporary uh, attention and, 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 and necessity of reflection on plasticity, plastics, and what that has done through to us since the 20th century, for the most part, right? Uh, and this resurgence of a movement that also was like early 20th century, right? And that is coming now into the fore with uh, new potentialities, right? Like that we, we, we thought surrealism was dead gone uh, and, and it has come back in this, in this way. So what, what are your thoughts on, on the relation then between surrealism and the plastic turn as you think it? Um, yes, um, I think this is a very good question. Uh, James, because I, I like this, uh, what you said, it's a very, very good question, and especially it uh, uh, triggers me to think how uh, how I uh, how I introduce this term, plastic surrealism in the book. Plastic turn has this term, if I'm not wrong, I, I mean, I have forgotten many lines from the book already, but I think I, I just introduced this term, plastic surrealism, working through in different plastic artists that are there are lots of international plastic artists that i worked with and i'm still working uh where i introduced this term because you know uh what i'm trying to do i'm not getting into the history of surrealism because most people would actually be aware of it but um there is uh, one thing that um uh, given my given my specialization or given my readings in modernism and modernist philosophy i can tell you that um, i i i I started reading one of the thinkers that uh, I thought can be a little interesting here for everyone to know is um, Apollonia. Now, Apollonia is um, Apollonia has written whatever text, whatever among his writings. You know, there is one word that in Apollonia's writings I really like, and that is Apollonia looks at uh, surrealism as a kind of a surprise. Now. This surprise is something that is getting lost. I I connect this with our with our contemporary loss of surprise that has come over us. I mean, there is nothing nothing that is uh, uh, that that has really an element of surprise in us anymore. I'm not using the word surprising. Uh, uh, that's that's not the term. The term is the surprise. And Apollonia has this uh, a part because uh, I remember that he, were, while writing on Jordi, Jordi de Quireco, I mean, this, this painter that is Giordo, Giorgio de Quireco, that's the correct pronunciation, I'm sure, that Jordi de Quireco is this painter who, who writes this way when, when he is writing about Apollonia, writing about Quireco is that he points out that uh, very interesting he uses the term you know um as i'm going through a, a fair amount of modernist literature of late he uses the term plastic enigmas there this is a term that i found in that particular writing plastic enigmas so he says that there's a strangeness of the plastic enigmas that's presented by Kiriko, uh still escapes most observers he points out and in order to describe this um, fatal character of modern things, Kiriko, you know, utilizes the most modern motive force of all surprise. So the importance of this passage lies, you know, in the role allotted to surprise. And surprise actually has this aesthetic component of certain modernist paintings. At the same time, it also has a tremendous value in understanding surrealism today. Because uh, Dali and whatever follows from there, the host of other people, you know, uh, that kind of surrealism has a kind of uncanniness, maybe a sort of strangeness. Uh, but, the, but, but I think the surprise that Apollonia talked about is something that is coming back to our plastic surrealism that I am uh, very interested in writing about. And Interestingly enough, you know, um, uh, Apollonia also, uh, in some form, he talks about that uh, my ideal in art, whether it's my senses or my imagination, and no ideal but truth perpetually new. And this truth, he talks about, that truth is the real surprise, that, that, that surprise that beings, they beget 
at the same time something that changes that it produces so this surprise is something that uh, i feel is very very important a factor that can be rewritten rethought reintroduced into how you see plastic surrealism as you say a kind of a resurgent surrealism in our in our times let us not call it a postmodern times we are probably a little more complicated than postmodernism so um one point that i want to keep it short because we are already uh, very temporarily extended um i just want to say two things here before before we move on to the next subject you know plastic again i come to the material i'm not talking about the plasticity because you know if you are looking at say for instance you're looking at a simple um dali painting or you're looking at some surrealist artist at this moment i will tell you um there is um tremendous amount of surrealist touch to plastic art now at this moment and um uh, there is a Pakistani uh, uh, plastic artist uh, called Ali Jishti who does all his work with plastic bags. And if you go and look up for his paintings, there, uh, sorry, those, those installations that are available on the internet, you'll be surprised. I use the word surprise. You will be surprised to see how plastic bags can really start to produce a tremendous amount of tremor inside you the tremor in emotion, the tremor about the contemporary developments that are happening around you. And this and this tremulation that comes out of it, this tremble that comes out of it, produces an excess in your thinking, the, the surplus in your thinking. So reality, the way you see a plastic bag as real, that plastic bag when torn, used, reused, all discarded plastic bags, once they are brought in to produce an art form where you see that there's a war war scene where the bleeding is on i mean i cannot explain that to you unless you go and see that that photograph there on the internet by college just the, you will see how a material something that you sort is the real plastic bag starts to develop a surreal quality a quality beyond the reality of its own representation almost like um uh, 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 the Italian philosopher uh, uh, Mario Perinola talking about shadow of representation. That is, there is always that shadow of the representation that you find there. You are lighting up a reality, but the surreal is the shadow that comes after the light. So it is, it is this ability of the plastic material that starts to transform the way we start to look at surrealism. So maybe that point that you are making, um, James, that connects with this very idea of how plastic reality changes the way we think and get surprised, and at the same time that connects it with your earlier question, where you mentioned plastic rhythm. Because if surrealism has a kind of a rhythm, then plastic surrealism will have a different rhythm to go with. And this rhythm is very distinctive, because this rhythm extends the kind of understanding of surrealism that we really had in the modernist times. Thank you. That, that is a fantastic uh, uh, answer. I especially like your linking it with the idea of surprise because so, so I, I love etymology and I write on etymology a lot. And the French, obviously, the surprendre is the, it shares the, the same prefix, sur, yeah. uh, surrealism, as in, you know, to take you from above, right? And, and, and you mentioned a quote saying, saying uh, truth is the real surprise, right? Um, and it also, when you talk about the plastic bags, uh, especially people who live uh, like me in, in, in the United States, we know how much that proliferation creates this surreal element, right? Like I, I tell you, my, my pantry is packed with plastic bags and they just keep growing and it's, it is very, very unnerving. Um, but, but this brings me to uh, my next question that is something that I, I, I think is, very important because it goes to the core of, of, of not, not only your book, but I think your project in some way, right? It's as, as it engages not only with philosophy, but with literature, uh, with discourses, and with the, like the matter or the material of the world, right? And we already touched a little bit on this uh, when we talked about Hegel and, and that tradition, right? Like, uh, but as we know, especially the, 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 
Western tradition of philosophy will always or has always been defined by logos, right? Like we talk about scientific discourse, right? Like, uh, and as we know, the term logos, the ancient uh, Greek term, means word, means uh, science, means discourse, means logic, and so on, right? Uh, and, and when I was like reading, uh, rereading your book and working on it, and then other of, of your books, I was always wondering about what is the relation between plasticity itself and logos, as the plasticity as you are developing it, right? Especially when we think about logos' own uh, connection in our tradition with uh, an, an Aristotelian notion of entelechy or entelechia, right? The idea of like forms are going to end up at their end. There is a teleology, a finality to forms, right? Yeah. Um, and how, you know, we go to the, the Gospel of, of John and we have in the beginning was the Logos, right? Like, and if we could replace it in some way uh, as in the beginning was plastic or plasticity, right? Like, uh, it's especially then as we can connect the Logos, and this is something that Derrida does really well, with fantasies not only of ending and finality, apocalyptic, right? But also with archaeology and the beginning, right? Like, again, the archaeology, right? Um, so, yeah, it's, I know it's a huge question, but... Uh, I know that the way you are especially working in this highly in, in interdisciplinary way, looking you know, at scientific uh, materials, looking at uh, literary discourses, traditional, non-traditional, art, right? Um, yeah, how do you see then like, this, this kind of relation to logos when you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like still the, 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 the bone of contention of, of all philosophy, for, at least for Western philosophy? So please. Yeah. Um... Yes, um, I agree with you, but it's a huge question. So I, I would just try to keep it short um, and try to explain that how how my understanding of plastic relates to logos. I uh, I still will not I still uh, demur a little to use the word plasticity in my writing because I still haven't published the book Plastic Figures. When that book comes out next year, then probably I'll have the authority to speak on plasticity. I only have the authority at this moment to speak on plastic. So um, I will stay confined to that to say that, yes, Logos, when it was used by Plato or the Stoics or the Philo and Plutarch, um, uh, it, 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 it had a kind of a coinage in great part, you know, where uh, one of those words, those meaning was fluid enough. The meaning was pretty fluid enough in a sense that it would somewhat could be called as democracy or would it be liberty and uh, in a politically minded age of course and there were uh, rather uses interpretations and uses and shades of the meaning of the logos and uh, but there still remained you know one of the the uh, one which may be summed up uh, in another and that is something that goes on to stay with us is the reason and that is where the the logos actually stands but at the same time, when I started reading up on St. John and writing to his gospel, the church, and uh, especially St. John, the way uh, St. John looks at his word, Logos, then of course it starts to change uh, uh, because it's, it, 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 of course, it borrows the Greek thought, but uh, there is a sort of a Christian revelation in a Greek God, if you can put it that way. So that is where the world is ruled by reason but the world is also ruled by a kind of divinity and uh, there is a connection that starts to get built with logos and nose so logos and nose that they 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 they, they come to be an equal use of these two terms which actually started to mean a kind of an active principle like uh, um uh, like the way one starts to look at enthusiasmus the way this term started to get coined and how logos starts to actually mean just not reason but also impersonal reason and uh, it also made law it made moral code but at the same time there is this kind of um divinity there's a kind of a certain amount of fluidity that impersonality so to speak that started to get coined. So this is a this is a long tradition. It would probably take another complete Zoom meeting to actually understand logos as a kind of a as philosophical category. But yes, when it came to logos, you know, I have a very different take with plastic. Here. I will explain that to you very briefly and very clearly. Uh, when I started, with the, the logos has always been a very problematic term for me. Something very enthralling as well because. Whenever I, my work has never been 
never been logocentric disciplinary wise. My, my, my thinking has never been logocentric, if you're using that term in the sense of the reason, not in the sense of the fluidity. Now, I, when I have that, I, I decided what am I going to do with this word plastic? How am I going to think about it? So when I speak about the plasticity of the plastic, then there is a way that you are challenging the logos of the material. Some way you are challenging the logos of the material. Because when you say the plasticity of the plastic, then you're building a different reason of plastic out of the reason that already exists in the plastic. Let me explain this to you very clearly what I what I thought out. But there is a second part to it. And the second part is the non-plasticity of plastic. Now, when you say non-plasticity of plastic, then actually you are not talking about plastic having plasticity anymore. Now you'd say how, because this is a very um, interesting question. I'm still with the material. Um, you have a plastic wrapper with you. And once you have finished having your chocolate, you just, 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 just throw the wrapper by the roadside. That is what usually happens. Now that chocolate wrapper, it flies and flows into the river, from the river to the ocean. And the ocean, it starts to get denuded, disintegrated. And then this plastic wrapper, this just disintegrates into microplastic, micro pellets. They are so small, not visible to the eye, invisible in the waters of the ocean, getting into the body of the fish. And from the fish, of course, the guy gets transported, transcorporeally, if you might call it, into the body of the humans. But the problem is that if when it is discovered inside the human body, as most human bodies these days, once a very close examination of, of the human body on, in, in plastic besetted areas across the world. Scientists are discovering plastic particles in the human body, very difficult, invisible, you cannot see, but they are there. Now, what are those, those particles, invisible particles? They are plastic. They haven't disintegrated. So you cannot say that the logos of plastic is, has disappeared. Plastic, when it was a wrapper, was plastic. That plastic, when it actually got particularized, miniaturized, diminished into or deminiaturized into a particle, that is also plastic. So this particle is the non-plasticity of the plastic. That is where the logos hasn't changed. The logos of the plastic hasn't changed, but the logos of the plastic has built on its fluidity. That is if a particular logos had given rise to a form or a structure called a wrapper, this particular invisible minute, minutest of particle inside the human body, that has also produced a different structure. So what happens to the logos then? The logos actually now becomes two. That is, it is almost like um, if, you, if, you, if you talk about uh, a kind of a, what they call it, the Cambridge theory of transposition. If you look at that, it's a both state option that you have. That is, logos of the plastic is both the plasticity of the plastic and the non-plasticity of the plastic. Now, that's a very different logos that we start to build in our times. This is completely different from, uh, uh, say, a Hegelian totality where figures are in motion or probably uh, a, a kind of understanding of what 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 our uh, uh, Luke Nasser would call it the uni totality I mean that sort of a thing is not there at all it's a totality that doesn't change it's a totality that is changing so the changing and the changelessness they are staying together there is a togetherness in their in their existence and their and, and, and in their predicament so plastic logos you know um, I call it the material aesthetic logos it, it, this is the material aesthetic logos for the book, if I may use this term, a new term here. The material aesthetic logos, it really talks about totality, not as totalitarian, but the totality as a both state option where plastic has a logos as a plasticity of plastic. Plastic does not have a logos in a sense, a non-plasticity of plastic. So those things, they come together to produce what I call it, the most debatable and another another way, another way of a plastic rhythm, basically, 
is about this plastic lovers. And uh, very quickly, one more sentence before we go to the next next session. Um, there is the question of the remainder. You know, we'll come to that probably later. I'm obsessed with this term, the remainder, because anything that we do and we draw up a balance sheet, whether it's about an idea or a thought or a concept or an idea, is a remainder. Now, uh, I know James would just spring up and say, Ranjan, this is a Deridian trace, but um, I, I, I still say it is something not also trace, it is something different. There is a remainder that can be in the form of a non-plasticity of plastic. That is how much you try hard to biodegrade plastic that is always there after you. So this is the remainder, a remainder that is non-biodegradable and a remainder that is degradable too. So probably, in a way, if you are connecting this to our understanding of text, then that is also very interesting in literature. In literature, there'd be two forms of understanding the logos of the literary. One would be the plasticity of the plastic, the logos, and the other would be the non-plasticity of the plastic logos. So the literary logos would really be a very complicated problematic term. Thank you. That was a fascinating uh, answer. And uh, you, you actually started giving me some more ideas related to things that uh, I'm working on. Actually, this, this notion of the plasticity and the non-plasticity of, of, of plastic, as you're mentioning, especially with that deleterious effect of the microplastic things, uh, particles that are killing us, <laughs> just to put it in, 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 in those terms, right? Uh, made me think of going back to logos, right? Like if we go to the, the etymology of logos, um, logos has, as you know, legere and these connections about reading and so on, but it also has this idea of like, like counting, collecting, putting something together, right? Making something very strong in, 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 and, and in that sense, non-flexible, non-plastic. Non -plastic. Um, and that relates it to the other part of the uh, but difficult tradition of Western philosophy, which is fascism and the fat and the thing that you get and tied together, right? And here is a small shout out to Tyler Williams that I see there, and we are editing a, a volume on deconstruction and fascism, and we talk about that, right? Like, so I see this, uh, especially in all the, uh, the recent plastic books that we've been, uh, or that I was reviewing that you mentioned, right? Your own uh, Tyler's edition of Malabus and Mass and so on, right? And, uh, Heather Davis, uh, there is always this idea of uh, the danger and the uh, ominous side of the plastic uh, pollution and so on that we have. Um, anyway, just thank you for that line of thought that you gave me there for future research. Um, I wanted to move on to something you already mentioned uh, because it's still interesting uh, to me to see exactly, uh, to ask you this question exactly uh, to pinpoint what is the, uh, the distinction that you see in your project to other traditions that you have mentioned, right? So. In my own engagement with plasticity, I come from the plastic arts, what we call in, in French, Spanish, and German, right? Like plastic kunst, uh, les arts plastiques, and so on, right? Um, and that's why I talk and work on surfaces, canvases, and so on. Um, and that when I started doing that reflection, right? Like, and I discovered first, like, as you did, and as you were mentioning, like Hegel, Kant, and then Malabu at some point, right? Um, it, I, I, I started like debating with that, and then I discovered your own work. And I saw that engagement, but in a way, as you said, with having Malabu behind your shoulder, in a way that was uh, challenging, that was different. And, and I want to, for you to talk precisely to that, like how did you, after seeing that tradition, how did you decide it? And you already mentioned a little bit more but, about this, but I want for you to go a little, a little bit further on this. How do you distinguish in your project from this tradition in the sense of, okay, so this is what I'm going to do. Um, to respond or to divert my own possibilities to this. So, please. Okay. Um, one thing, uh, James, I'd like to say that uh, we are already uh, more than an hour now. So, what we will do is that uh, we will probably discuss two more issues. I'm very um, uh, interested to actually engage you with your research on surfaces that uh, probably we can do. That in, after I have spoken about plastic art at this moment. Uh, and then we can just look into winding probably in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes maximum <laughs> because I completely understand that people on the portal uh, 
to get into this sort of a heavy discourse for two hours, uh, both you and me would actually be ostracized. So uh, it is better we just wind it up in the next 20 minutes. So um, coming to this plastic RTS, James, um, I think uh, this is very quickly, again, I say that I have a very different idea of plastic art. I, uh, I, I have spoken again at length on plastic arts in uh, the book called Plastic Tagore, where I have actually shown that anything that Tagore does is a part of the plastic arts. Now, what is that? I'll very quickly summarize that in the next five to six minutes. When it comes to, uh, say, looking at plastic art, when it comes to sculpture, then as I said, that is occupies the highest status for Hegel. Now, uh, there is a distinction that uh, Hegel also makes between verbal and formative arts, and uh, uh, that is also one of the uh, uh, virtues of the division is that it allows us to see how literature can be seen to recapitulate at a higher order the progress of formative arts. But Hegel calls it the total art, and then, of course, uh, um, uh, Hegel is probably less interested in the abstractions of Schlegel's, sorry, uh, Schelling's uh, exuberant idealism. And uh, uh, for Schelling, of course, this, this internal structure is probably the most important part. And uh, plastic arts will probably comprise architecture, it will comprise mass relief, it will be some sculpture. And uh, it also, in turn, it starts to echo music, painting, and their uh, painting but in the sense of drawing, modeling, or coloring, all these things they are very much a part of the plastic art. But um, what I uh, sincerely believe and uh, something that uh, Anagu does is that he explains that. He explains what uh, how Hegel wants to do with this plastic art. And it's a very fine exposition and a very detailed exposition for that matter. But for me, uh, when it comes to uh, not to talk very much about the philosophy of fine art by Hegel, because that would take, consume a fair amount of time and I want to keep it short, is that um, plastic art is art that really talks about a kind of a surplus. It talks about the surplus, at the same time, plastic art talks about a lack. So when there is a lack and the surplus, they come together there is all the time an exuberance an extend the area of meaning at the same time there is an exhaustion of meaning so what happens is that when we are talking about plastic art it becomes an expression of freedom of freeing man of freeing our thoughts from his finitude and this is the unbarring this is called in the tagorian sense it would be the unbounding and what happens is that once one when does that, there is a conscious exposure to a thought. At the same time, there is an unconscious exposure as well. So um, this, in my book, The Plastic Tagor, which all of you will get to read next year, hopefully, uh, I have brought in a comparison with a German painter, Paul Klee. And uh, in Paul Klee, I mean, it's, uh, when, when he, he, he writes about in The Thinking Eye, that, uh, that, that's the book, where Paul Clay is actually talking about this idea of what he means by this plastic art. And he starts to talk about that um, there would be, say, for instance, a sort of a self-portrait that one is drawing. So in self-portrait, you when there is a Tagore self-portrait and a Paul Clay self-portrait, I've written on that. But I just, just try to mention this to say that this kind of plastic art that is where I am portraying myself, but my portraiture is more about self-perception, self-deception. It's about self-distortion. Uh, it is about self-reflexivity. And it is marking a kind of a different plastic rhythm where I am going beyond self-representation in a sense that I'm unselfing myself. So if I'm unselfing myself and myself both, then what is happening? is that I start to build a different sort of a plastic art. This is the plastic that one uh, can be very interested. Say, for instance, if you are looking at uh, Mielio Ponti's uh, philosophy of art, 
and how Ponty actually starts to acknowledge um, displacement and aesthetic slippage. And uh, I, I remember that in, a, in his writings on indirect language and the voices of silence, I, I quoted for the audience, it's called the indirect language and the voices of silence where Ponty is talking about the modern painters. And there he wants nothing to do with the truth defined as resemblance of painting when the world. They would accept the idea for truth defining as a painting's cohesion with itself but the presence of a unique principle in which affect each means expression with a certain contextual value. So what replaces the object is not the subject. It is the elusive logic of the perceived world. That's the philosophical way of putting it. I repeat this, what replaces the object is not the subject. It is the elusive logic of the perceived world that is, is is actually creating it and um clay uh clay points this out to say that if you if you, if you come to clay's work because that connects with ponty a lot um uh, he says that a recognition that at bottom i'm a poet so you know clay he considers himself to be a poet at bottom i'm a poet and after all should be no hindrance in the plastic arts so tagore at bottom was a poet, but he went on to become a painter of the later part of his life. Clay began as a painter, but at bottom he considers himself to be a poet. So these two people are not different. The poet and the painter, they are not different. And there is no hindrance in between a poet and the painter in the formation of plastic art. And this is very important in understanding because um, there is a sort of operational rhythm as I might call this, between poetic painting and pure plastic art. Now, this is this is the this is where I must stop because there are so much, uh, so many things that are, uh, are crowding me at this moment. But this is where you know what happens is that if you develop a sort of a connection between, as I said, that at bottom what you are and how you represent, they are very different. So what you are, the self and the unselfing, they are so different there is all the time a communication of a divergent discontinuity singularity at the same time there is a negotiation as well to go with then this develops the whole idea of plastic art to be something you can call it the post literary this is the idea of the post literary that i'm very very interested in and investing myself a lot into it where there is the notion of the transcendent visible something that is transcendent but yet visible. So if you are calling God the transcendent, he cannot be seen. But when you say the transcendent visible, then the transcendent can be seen. So, you know, this is where the post literary works, where there is something that starts to develop a completely different disposition, a different tenor, a different chemistry, a different poetics, and at the same time, a different kind of rhythm. Thank you. That was a great, great answer. And it, again, it, it gave me uh, so much to uh, reflect on. I didn't know you were working on or that. You had addressed Paul Clay, which is one of my biggest interests uh, in, in the plastic heart. So that's fantastic. But yeah, James, James, I would just like to uh, ask uh, you to talk a little about your work on surfaces, because you've spoken about scratches and, and, and dots and lines. And uh, also you've spoken about the chafing and strafing of the surfaces that you make. Something that I have uh, spoken about in my next book, The Plastic Figures as Plastic Surfaces. So why don't you speak a little for, for the audience to know a little, very oh. briefly, of course, very briefly, of yes. course. Yeah, yes. we'll do it briefly because I, I think we are jumping to the time for questions. So I, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, I, 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 as I mentioned before. We'll take questions work. after this. We we'll surely take questions yeah. after this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my interest in plasticity became okay, or, or started precisely from the plastic arts and I, you know, all the plastic arts and uh, involve some kind of surface, right? And that's also part of my research on tattooing as a form of art. Um, and especially in what you were talking at the beginning, when you set up this discussion in terms of hylomorphism, form and matter, obviously going to that tradition, what gets sometimes overlooked is precisely that thin film between the form and the matter, right? Like, and that's, uh, as some of you might know from my article on my article on Malibu for Mosaic, that's my criticism uh, on, on her yes. uh, sometimes. Uh, yes, I which, wanted which to I say have, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I'll say that she seems to in in, in the Tyler's uh, edited volume. I saw her engaging more in some of those texts with surfaces. So I'm really excited about that development, and, yeah. and for all of us interested in plasticity to talk more about that. Uh, but yeah, that is kind of the interest that I, what I'm doing, and that's why it has to do also with as I, as I, as I said, tattooing or the Marquis de Sade that's in corporal uh, scratches, marks, and so on. And then, yeah, I'll take it when you talk about uh, plastic figures, I'm very excited because that will be connected to, to my research on Lyotard's discourse on figures as precisely another form of uh, a, 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 plasticity, a plasticity that always has to take into account the register, which means the scratch, which means that plays what you know, Plato called Cora, where yes. things get marked. Right. Course, so yeah. that's pretty much where I'm going. But I, I, I'll be happy to for us to jump into the question, uh, and people can can start. Yeah, I, I saw some pop up. So yeah. I don't yes, know. Georgia, I, step in, I guess. Uh, George, are you there? Yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yeah. uh, are there questions coming up? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, okay, so, uh, George, yeah. So, uh, can, yeah. Uh, so, thank you, Professor Martin, for this uh, wonderful session, wonderful lecture, and uh, such, such. It was such an uh, enriching experience for us all. And uh, thank you, Professor Ranjan Bush, as well. Now, we would proceed to our question and answer uh, session segment. But since we have a time restraint, so uh, we are limiting uh, the time from. 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, and I have, I can see some questions here and I would like to read it out for you, uh, if you allow me. Uh, okay, if, is it okay if I read it out? Yes, sure. Okay, so, uh, yeah, uh, so the first question from is from Shonu Shah and he's asking that how can we relate plastic literature with other form of literature? Uh, well, that's a. Um, now, how do I answer this? Because um, this is, I'm planning a whole book on plastic literature, so <laughs> that that's really puts me in a spot. But yes, um, uh, the the thing is that maybe if I can answer this very quickly, because we don't have time, you have to wind up by nine. Um, we talk about post-colonial literature. We talk, we say modernist literature, we are starting to categorize literature, different kinds of different ways of literature. I mean, when someone says that I'm going to teach modernist literature, then people are not expecting that I'm going to teach Shakespeare. So, you know, this sort of a compartmentalization has have really introduced, have come into our ways of syllabic formation or canonical formations, whichever way you put it. Uh, plastic literature is should not be mistaken in uh, this the, the plastic literature the term that i introduced i mean that's a term should not be misinterpreted as plasticity of literature if if that comes into play then i think the the whole conceptual motor uh, or, or a more a malabian motor schemes would be completely lost because i actually don't want it i never wanted that to happen what i wanted to do is that Again, the material aesthetic becomes important. Again, I come back to really chant the same mantra about plus material aesthetic. Because the point is, you have to understand world literature, comparative literature through a material. This particular material is a climactic material. It is a, a cataclysmic material. We, we see this material all throughout, but yet we don't know what we are doing with it. I mean, one must try to understand literature per se. I'm talking about literature per se. Through the material and how the material starts to influence the way we think. Now, how, let us, just one instance, because that's there in the book, I mean, James would endorse. I spoke about a term, the plastic world literature. We talk about world literature. We talk about world literature in the way it's being formed. There are, there are theorists who have spoken about world literature in different forms. I've been going back to Karl Marx, going back to Heidegger and the rest. But 
what we also have actually not been able to understand is that how plastic can contribute to the worldization of literature. I'm sorry, Nossi, I'm using it. There is a Nossi expert sitting before me as James, but I'm using this as a sort of a plastic way of worldization of literature, how the material can really produce that kind of a, a understanding or effect of literature. So what it does, the movement of plastic seen from the perspective of the sciences, the understanding of plastic as we understand in our daily lives, like we could not finish a conversation. We actually was thinking about James and me. We were talking about these uh, plastic surfaces where I would like to respond by saying that plastic really produced a complete change in our idea of surfaces when it was discovered. Because plastic became gleaming, plastic became glittering, plastic became smooth, plastic became transparent. There was nothing of that sort happening with wood or metal that never happened. So much of variety that plastic actually brought into our understanding of surfaces. So plastic has a behavior, a particular behavior. Would this behavior be helpful to understand literature? That's one. And the plastic that we have lost control over industrial as plastic as it becomes waste how is this waste cynic plastic or this waste centric plastic how this starts to develop in its own way to produce its own forms of literature so the focus primarily in plastic literature is about the material and again i uh, repeat what i said that is the plasticity of the plastic and the non-plasticity of the plastic they would both contribute to the literary of literature that's it so uh, now going on to the next question from shivayu vattataji uh, could there be a, could there be a linkage between the visible logos of plastic even in interventionist measures like recycling and the perpetuity of global capital and the invisible traces or remainders in micro pages as standstill points of exception in Agamben's term. Yes, uh, uh, James, why don't you do it? <laughs> oh, happily. Uh, I'm not an Agamben expert, but I, I get the gist of the question. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Suvia. It's, it's a really good question. Um, I think especially looking at uh, Ranjan's work, of course, but also other researchers I listened to in this year, like Heather Davis uh, and Alice Ma, you see precisely that connection between uh, that logos that we have come to, uh, or plastic logos, if you will, that we have come to see uh, through the emergence of the possibilities of plastic and capitalism or the logic of cap capitalism and accumulation, right? Uh, Heather Davis, I think, does a particularly interesting read in the sense of, on the, uh, let's say, pessimistic side, right? That logic of, as, as we know, and, and there are videos every day coming more and more about how it is precisely big business that has um, pushed for the ideas of recycling, right? Or for the carbon uh, footprint in order precisely to keep doing the proliferation of pollution while putting the guilt uh, or the responsibility on the consumer, right? So there is that side of, of, of capitalism working with plastics and plastic logics in order to keep their production and their voracity going as well. And then Davis, for example, and, and, and Ryan, I think you do it as well in other lines of thought, uh, but Davis does it in the idea also of the multiplicity and the new possibilities of plasticity, as you were Ryan mentioning with, for example, the new surfaces of plasticity that we have in terms of, for example, queer identities or post-capitalist identities, right? So there is that tension of, uh, is the plastic turn or turns that we're going through, right? Like, are they gonna be co-opted into that rhizomatic machine of capitalism that is just gonna keep going and, you know, uh, take us to that apocalypse of the logos? And then there is the one of resistance, right? Resistance through art, resistance through literature, that, that plasticity like takes us uh into give us that possibility right that would be my take on it uh, uh i know ryan has like different lines of thought here uh some that go together but yeah that would be my take on it um uh, and it will be a, a good challenge to read it in terms of agamben for sure uh, thank you professor martin now moving on to the next question 
uh, which is from Roger Shubramondol, and he's asking, does the rhizomatic rupture owe a lot of transgenetic prototype change? Uh, I uh, maybe just I can have a look at the question. I didn't get it. Uh, can you? It's, if you look in the chat, can you read there. Yes. One more time. I think that, uh, maybe I just can read read the question one more time. Yeah. Just a moment. Open the chat box to see. Uh, yes, it says, uh, does the rhizomatic rupture owe a lot to transgenetic prototype ch chain of plastic? If so, doesn't the self cannibalism embody the mesh pattern as a site of fear? Uh, well, uh, this is a complicated phrasing of the question, but I think the simple answer to this is that anything that is rhizomatic will always have its own ruptures, because without rupture, there cannot be rhizome. And uh, for Deleuze, for Deleuze, for that matter, uh, even 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 if there is a fair amount of Deleuze, of course, in my next book, but I would just say that, uh, that rhizome produces its own rupture. At the same time, what it does it says rhizome is very much a kind of a mesh pattern. I mean, a mesh is actually made through not just the question of negotiation, but also negotiations through rupture. So any kind of a thought that one starts to think is that there has to be that rupture as less about interruptions, but more about communication. So mesh, when one produces a mesh, then one is actually bringing many things together, not just not just to open up the lines of disjunctures or discontinuities. For um, coding from my book, The Last Two Figures is such a temptation when you've finished a manuscript and there is so much that is there still in your head, uh, where I've spoken about circle and uh, circle as a kind of figure. And what I've actually said that circle is all the time a figure that you're trying to circle so this is the circling of the circle is what you continue to do because every time you draw a circle it's the image of the circle that you draw not exactly the one so this when you're drawing the image of the circle that's a rupture but it clearly has its own connections and dialogues and negotiations with the circle per se so rupture and mesh they are both about interruptions and negotiations at the same time yes Uh, now, so the next question uh, is from uh, Reet Chattopadhyay. Uh, is asking, is saying that uh, since you talked about the plastic as an explosion and as an accident, do you think there are any political implications of the way you think about plasticity? And if his reading is correct, uh, he thinks that Catherine Malibu is deeply interested in the political implications. Uh, as she writes, we want resistance of plasticity because of its ability to explode, which in turn ties with her work uh, with anarchism. Okay, um, is this a question? Uh, okay, okay, it's, just, it's from Reet Chattopadhyay, right? Yes, sir. Uh, about the political Reed, yes, implication. Reed has asked this yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, I think, uh, James, you will agree with me that Malabu's recent work is on anarchism. And uh, this is where he's trying to uh, develop a sort of a new way of looking at the political community. So it, it's, a, it's a way of looking at how community formations can really work. But although Malabu is working on the idea of the clitoris in a sense that she she's working on sexuality and also bringing anarchism as a different kind of a category for community i would say yes malabu's work has uh, a lot of implications for political understanding and uh, uh, to suffice it to say that uh, my next book the plastic figures is is primarily necessitated by the fact that 
people might just start calling me as a kind of a material theorist who's trying to bring in this material aesthetic into it and bringing plastic as a theory machine and not talking about other issues which are more relevant and impinging on our day-to-day -day life. So this book on plastic figures, it really has, because that was something we were about to discuss as, uh, as James would have asked, would have probably had a question on how, um, what am I actually trying to do after this, this plastic term? So just to really suffice that uh, aspect of the discussion, I would say that yes, in this plastic figures book, I've spoken extensively on what I call plastic secular. I have done work on plastic history. And also I've brought in a very different interpretations of the global South through the idea of plastic figurality. Plastic figurality is the concept that plastic figures actually starts to bring in. And global South, uh, politics, religion, secularism, secular, nature. There is a long essay on nature as well there which is a kind of, I call it the plastic green. So how actually these things can be very political in nature? Because one thing, one we must understand, Reed, since your question you've asked here, is that anything that we think around the plastic is not outside the political. Because if you are talking about political merely through resistance and meetings and debates, that is not the political. Political is a bigger term. I mean, a uh, Ronsorian way of looking at the political, probably beyond that, that the way we look at how uh, a political is just merely not about politics, something more than that. So it's a very um, voluminous, pregnant, uh, debatable, profound term that has its own plasticity. Yes, uh, we can be have time for two quick questions, maybe. Uh, one, one I should shift it to James to answer. Let me choose one from there. Um, the second I think I can see here, uh, does the destruction of plastic forms, stoicism lead to emergence of more human elements in aesthetic surrealism? And where does the matter itself blend in all of this? Well, this is a, the, the, these are, these are questions. Uh, may I ask that these questions, uh, what did you write to us, to James and me, so that we can just about draft an answers for you? Because, you know, when these questions come up, then I'm very tempted to give a long answer, but uh, we are surely run out of time and badly. Uh, sir, I think we can so, ask uh, a file raised. Uh, she has she has been waiting for long uh, for her question. The oh, time, yes, file time yes, yes, please. Yes. Uh, there, please ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ranjalta. Uh, um, I must say that my mind is completely blown. And I had the opportunity to listen to you a few days back at ILSR. And that led me to think that I should not miss this opportunity to listen to you uh, again. So my question is, um, you were talking about plastic rhythm. And uh, as I'm uh, interested in feminist care ethics and caregiving uh, politics, so my question veers around that. Uh, so my question is, can the mundane, like so-called mundane function of caregiving be seen as an act of plastic rhythm since it is a performative act and when a woman caregiver, a mother or a daughter navigates the space between the self and the other, that is the child or the parent uh, through the negotiation of affect and emotions they uh, they like uh, created by social or existential issues they create an aesthetic space of relationality that is predicated upon a uh, upon a balanced approach between the self and the other right so there are like uh, several uh, literary representations of uh, women caregiver like a mother or a daughter though they are like navigating the space between uh, the self and the other through distribution of various emotions and affects and that that creates a space for uh, balanced uh, balanced space for like aesthetic space for love and care so can this be can this be uh, uh, like considered to be a plastic aesthetic or like plastic yeah, sure, sure. Uh, yeah sure it, it 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 definitely works i think james you will agree with me uh, this definitely works because um, care, uh, if you uh, just focusing on the word care, um, as we philosophers, you know, we have a problem, we just get stuck with words. Uh, that is the problem we have because those words that do not come as words, they come with the volume of concepts. So I'm stuck with the word care and this care has a huge philosophical trajectory of its own. I mean, uh, uh, it definitely uh, 
getting a fair amount of prominence through high vega but i would say this one video using the word care care has this sort of a plastic foundation to it not just plastic but if you since you have used the word care i think i'll be more interested in uh, connecting the word care with plasticity that is where it works because in that case uh, my brand of doing plastic would be more towards the the, the plasticity of the material uh but the the, 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 the care that you are talking about surely in a way satures or probably in a way uh, uh, interrogates the idea of caregiving. So uh, just a quick thought here that when you talk about caregiving, then you are really giving form to care. If I really can put it that way, that you are actually giving form to care. Because when you say caregiving, then it really comes with a form, a sort of a predetermined, predisposed form. But this presupposed form of caregiving changes when you start to give care to someone as a caregiver. So there is a core of an agency that comes into the whole idea of the caring, and it changes again, connecting all the discussions together, changes the entire logos of our thinking of caregiving as an act. So when you put it as caregiving as a performative, I agree with you, because caregiving now would means giving form to care. And that is very singularistic because you cannot really talk about a traditional overarching transcendent way of giving care to people because that would be where uh, that would be where you are trying to build a kind of an institutionalized departmentalized way of giving care so care when it starts to become a form form giving forming kind of an act then it certainly starts to become has its own plasticities of manifestation yeah, yeah thank you so much very quick answer though yes. there things that we could have been saying. Uh, yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you so much. And uh, also is the fact that when a mother, in case of caregiver can be anyone, but when we talk about a mother or a daughter as a caregiver, then uh, the uh, then the like un uh, like reciprocity of the of the child or uh, the parent uh, that that becomes that like that problematizes the caregiving experience for the caregiver also. Yes, it does. If, if, if I could just add something really quick, because uh, I think this is a fantastic question. And I think that any consideration of a new materialism that thinks about plasticity or through plasticity, just because it's re-engaging with hylomorphism, form and matter, is engaging with questions of gender and with questions of motherhood. Uh, so I think like it is absolutely right to see, and, 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 and Ranjan could answer it beautifully, uh, how there is always a connection between that, like, gender, cultural, human experience of care, as it has been determined through our traditions, and the new possibilities and the plastic possibilities of modifying that, right? So, yeah, it's a beautiful question and, and a beautiful research. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. And I would also like to uh, like uh, ask if you can uh, suggest me some uh, resources on this book. Yeah, we will connect later, surely. Okay, oh, surely, surely, okay. thank you. Uh, some, uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, so sh we should James is, is asking a question uh, and he's uh, again asking to, for a response. Uh, plasticity with plastic money in association with literature. Now, that's a very difficult question for me, Ron. I, I, I am completely in a mesh now at this moment, to put it that way, that how I'm going to connect plasticity, plastic money and with literature. Now, when you talk about money, then of course it takes me to the philosophy of money. I mean, I again I get lost in philosophy, so uh, that is one thing that can happen. But I'm still wondering how plastic money and literature can be connected. Maybe Rohan, please don't be disappointed. Um, uh, this is there is a rush with a clock completely against us, and uh, if by the time everyone deserts us in the portal and we and me and James continue conversation. It is very important that uh, we end somewhere. So Rohan, please put in your question to me or James. You write to us and I will certainly respond after thinking out a proper answer for you. Hope that uh, you know, are not disappointed much with that. Sir, I have taken all the questions as well. Those mm -hmm. who did not receive an answer, uh, we will try to contact you. Yes, yes. And you please can do. definitely email uh, Professor Martel or Ranjan Bush. Yes. So now over to you, uh, Rajit, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ghosh. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. It was really an 
enriching experience. Uh, can I ask the last question to Professor yes, Kuch? Uh, just a, a thing, because uh, this uh, conversation was all about plastic turn. Uh, I just want to know uh, what can we expect from plastic figures? Because we are all looking forward to that uh, second book. Oh, yes. Uh, Maybe you can just uh, uh, tell us yes. some yeah, teasers about the book. Yeah, this is, uh, this is like uh, seducing me into, uh, into releasing few things out from the book and then endangering my position with my editor at Cornell. So I completely understand the malice and the malevolence behind that question. But yes, um, I will. Um, uh, I will certainly give a very quick answer uh, in a minute or two. Yes, plastic figures is uh, it's, it's a book where I'm trying to bring about, develop the idea of plastic figurality. I'm sure James is going to love this because he's riding on surfaces, so the figures will be very important there. So, plastic figurality is a kind of a concept that uh, I'm introducing here. Now, to do that. I have gotten into different figures, different sorts of figures, and that could be that is related to religion, that is related to secularism, or related to history, to global south, to to nature, the nature as we see now, and everything comes with figures. So what happens is that uh, I call it uh, in the global south, I call it the plastic political. For the history, it is the plastic history. For secular, I call it the plastic secular, and I exemplify how these things like plastic nature, I've introduced again a very wrong uh, concept on plastic nature. Now, again, I try to exemplify what I really mean by this, but in trying to do this, I have introduced plastic figurality on three firm bases. One is that I've spoken about plastic force. This book is also built on force. And when you look at force, you go back definitely to um, the philosophical tradition. And uh, for the first time, I really literally avoid writing on philosophers because um, uh, I feel when I write on philosophers that I'm really constricting my readership a lot. Because if I write too much on Hegel and Heidegger, most people don't get what I'm actually trying to say. So I really avoid doing that. But here I am forced to, for the first time in my life, to write on Hegel, to write on Heidegger, to write on Deleuze, because that is the force that I'm talking about. Not a single of the philosophers that I've mentioned have spoken about plastic force, but plastic force is one of the paradigms which actually starts to build plastic figurality. That's one. Then there is the question of plastic rhythm. James would be uh, living up to that, because that's plastic rhythm again comes up there as one of the paradigms to produce plastic figurality. And, of course, in the end, I have spoken about plastic lines. So, you know, how lines really start to create our figures around the world. So this has nothing to do with plastic turn. This book is a completely different take on plastic from plastic turn. So there will be uh, no connection whatsoever between the two. Uh, if you read plastic figures and you haven't read plastic figures, uh, plastic turn, that's fine. Uh, that is okay. And if you read Plastic Turn, you don't want to read Plastic because that's fine too, because they're read two different books. They are falling on two different strains of thought. So this much should be enough as a teaser, um, because the rest of the material are there in the book for you to see within a year's time. Hopefully, my uh, the readers who are going to read, they'll be kind on the manuscript and give me kind and approving comments so that my editor is convinced that what I've actually done with plastic figures can really go to the press. OK, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much again for the uh, wonderful conversation, uh, the two uh, professors here. And thank you so much, uh, the audience, the lovely audience. The audience has been very interactive, and they have been very supportive. And they have been very, very patient. Big, yeah. Very patient, yeah. Uh, so, thank you so much. Uh, good night, James. Good night from India. It's already night, 9, 9 yes, p.m. Dinner time. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night guys. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you.